Hi everyone. Have you ever thought about building your own roller coaster? By the end of this video, I hope you think about it. There are two books that I know of on that very topic, and this man wrote both. I recently took a trip to Seattle to meet with Paul Gregg, a retired aerospace engineer who now uses his years of accumulated skill building airplanes and missiles to create meticulously engineered backyard roller coasters for his grandkids. More than that, Paul Gregg has gone to great lengths to document and refine the process of building his roller coasters, so that if you read his books, anyone can build their own. So, all, all of your coasters are gravity powered, yeah? Yeah. Or, or human powered? Yeah. There's a reason for that. You know, I, I have the capability of designing a chain lift system. The trouble is, it costs a lot, for one thing. That, ch that chain is expensive. And the gears are expensive, the uh -huh. motor is expensive, everything's expensive. I didn't spend on the cart and track $450 on this, this whole thing. $450 on this? Yeah. The reason I don't have, the, the primary reason I don't have a lift system is because that guarantees adult supervision. No, uh. kid, no, no little kid is going to push that up there themselves. And I store the carts away from the track so teenagers could never get in my yard and hurt themselves. The construction of these roller coasters is surprisingly simple. The materials used are 2x4s and PVC pipe that you can buy at any hardware store. But don't let that fool you. Serious engineering went into these roller coasters, more than I ever guessed just by looking at the finished product. I flew to Seattle wanting to ride one of these coasters if I could, but before feeling confident enough to do that, I had to learn a little more about them from Paul, and learn a little about Paul himself. I really like these little things. You, uh, you get this for three bucks? Walking into Paul Gregg's workshop, there are little engineering kits and toys everywhere, which is a sure sign of someone I'm going to get along with. In his entryway was a glass case full of Sterling engines, boxes of electronics. So I made these for the grandkids too. Yeah. The little water jet comes up and it, this is like a lunar lander. It uh, goes up on the water jet and just sits there. And oh, spins that's around. cool. Pretty quickly, I started to notice the roller coaster related items in various places around the shop, testing equipment and pieces of track. The first things Paul showed me were carts he had stored on his shelf. So I started out with this. This cart is what I call a two dimensional cart. So the wheels don't articulate. It just goes on this track I'm gonna show you. Okay. And the kids ride in here. It's, you know, it's for little kids. This cart, as Paul just described, is for a two-dimensional roller coaster, meaning it might go up and down hills, but it doesn't turn side to side. This makes the cart very simple because it doesn't need wheels that turn. It's literally just a box on four fixed wheels with guides to keep it from slipping off the track. That makes a two-dimensional roller coaster by far the easiest to build, and you can see an example right in Paul's backyard. So this is the first track we built. Wow. We avoided having to make too tall a towers by using the terrain in our deck here. So this is what you would call it. This is like a 2D roller coaster. Yeah, this is the 2D roller coaster. It's got a 3D card on it. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. The nice thing about this out and back track is the track's only 70 feet long, but I get it like a 250 foot ride out of it. Yeah, going Because I'm backwards. going back and forth. <laughs> it can't go off the top. Everybody asks me that. Oh yeah, I'm sure you've got the, the math worked out on that. The plays huh? apart. Oh, does it? Yeah. And there's, some, there's several reasons why it can't go off the top. We'll get more into how Paul puts these tracks together later, but for now let's look back at the carts, because that I think is the most difficult part to wrap your head around in understanding a full 3D roller coaster. Something that I never really thought about is that a cart on a curved track requires wheels that are articulated in all sorts of ways. I quickly realized that just that 2D cart, the 3D cart was going to be much more complex than a 3D cart's much more complex than a 2D cart because it has to do a lot of different things. It has to do the normal yaw because the track's turning. Uh -huh. It has to do pitch because the track's going up and down. 
And it has to do roll because the track could be turning left or right. So you would need to have this on both sets of wheels. You can't no, even... No, oh, okay. The back is different yet. So there's a problem with this. The roll has to get reacted somewhere into the track. Yeah. And I do that all on the... Because most of the mass is on the back end of the cart. This will not react roll because it's free. It's got a degree of freedom there. It's on there. Don't let me forget. What happens when when this happens, you know? Yeah. The front end won't react that. The back end has to, so that's why this complicated mechanism right. to react the overturning roll moment. Right. So to simplify, a 3D roller coaster cart needs a front axle with all three degrees of freedom to follow a complex track. The rear axle needs yaw and pitch, but it cannot be allowed to roll or the cart will just fall over. You start to appreciate just how much work Paul has put into this when you realize he's designed 34 different carts in CAD, and built 6, just to solve these various issues with the maximum amount of safety. And there's good reason for that thoroughness. If I pushed you hard, you might get 2.5 or say 3 Gs. Let's put a 250 pound guy on here. You got 300 pounds. That's 300 pounds times 3. Yeah. That's 900 pounds. And all of a sudden, Wow. Yeah, you're dealing with or a four G's. lot of... If you were going to do a loop, you'd end up trying to get closer to four G's. And that's 1,200 pounds. So am I going to put 1,200 pounds on this, on this plastic track? It, it all of a sudden, you know... Yeah, right. You realize this stuff needs to be fairly robust. Now we're starting to see the seriousness of building a homemade roller coaster. There's a lot of force applied to this track and cart. The fact that Paul has been able to build these coasters using nothing but 2x4s and PVC pipe is a testament to how good the engineering is. So let's look now at the track. So this, this is like a little piece of test track that you would have built to, to align your wheels and things and build carts on? Or? Well, I, I just store this on here because this one's just hard to do. But yeah, it's a good idea to look at this track. And that's kind of where I started. Uh, I noticed the ones online when I started had just flat ends here. Uh -huh. And I thought it would be a big improvement to cup the ends of the ties. And they, then they just were drilling their screws in there. So the side wheels were whacking the screw heads. So I, I, the other first thing I did was put these up where the, where the main wheels and the side wheels don't hit the, the fastener heads. These are two of the things left over from my uh, rail tie joint testing. So in other words, if this rail was square like this, I would make a bunch of these okay. and I would put them on here and then I would put my rail on and screw it down. That is much stronger than relying just on the wood because now the, this plastic is taking the load, not the wood breaking apart in a what we call a mode one. When composites go like this, that's mode one. Uh -huh. That's a when mode they, one failure when they, when they splinter when they peel. Yeah. Okay. okay. This is a steel thing it would do the same thing. You can make these pretty cheap. So this is one of the things Paul and I talked about in detail. This joint right here between the rail and the ties. This is what Paul determined to be the weakest part of a wooden track. So this is where most of his effort has been focused. This joint where the 2x4 tie is cupped to fit the rail and slightly offset so there's more support on the bottom of the track is good to about 900 pounds per joint, which when you account for the cart having four wheels dividing the force on multiple joints at once, that's a pretty good margin of safety, at least for the weight of small children. At one point, Paul worked on designing a coaster to be ridden by full-grown students at MIT, and for that he tested other methods of joining the ties. Some of the designs were actually so strong that the wheels on the testing rig started to fail instead of the joint. So that brings us to the next weakest point, which are the plastic rails. Paul tested these as well to make sure that the pipe between ties was more than strong enough to support the load, and it is. But there's a problem with plastics, and that is sunlight. Pla all plastics start out from the factory with nice toughness. Most plastics and composites you let you put them out in the sun a while and and they lose a lot of toughness which means they're going to yeah. fracture if something whacks them probably the best thing is and what i recommend to do is people use pvc and i always recommend you use the conduit i did not know this that the conduit uh, style pvc has 
some kind of UV protection in it it's compared set, to right there, sunlight resistant. Now, what that means, really, show, trying to find data on what that really means, like how much more resistant is the gray electrical conduit than the white plumbing PVC, I can't find on the internet. I tested yeah. it myself, though. I had tracks painted and unpainted in my yard for two years. The fracture toughness loss is about 50% without paint, and it's only maybe 5% with paint. The, the lesson is, you probably want to use PVC, but you, you have to paint it. The track that I finally am going to ride is the first one that Paul built, the 2D track we saw earlier. This actually uses ABS rails instead of PVC, which Paul says he's torn about potentially being the better material. It's much softer than PVC, but it stays flexible and is held up well over time. All the same, I weigh a lot more than Paul's grandkids, so what we'll be doing next is to test the track for a rider of my weight. A person would probably ride a little high. We are <laughs> certifying the cart and track at the same time. Uh -huh. We're putting one and a half times the maximum expected operating load. Our next rider is going to be 150 pounds, so we need 225 pounds. What's 75, 73, and what? 70? 74 and a half, 75. 75. 150, 150 plus oh, 73. Perfect. perfect. So we're not going to push it. We're just going to let it go. And that's yeah. what we're going to do for you too. Yeah. Just because if you push it, you don't know what's you don't know what the loads are. Right. <laughs> wow. I mean, that's pretty good. I didn't hear anything. Uh-uh. So what we want to do is check every fastener head in the in the high stress spots and see if anything has come loose. Usually you'd hear something. So this track is now certified for a 150 pound rider with a one and a half factor safety. Awesome. That does it for me. All right. All right, so the track held up to a dynamic test of 150% of my weight, so it's safe for me to ride. The audio was a little messed up on this next clip because as I rode this coaster, my head was tucked in toward the microphone. But stick with me because we learned something really interesting here. All right, let's see. I'm ready. Okay. Yeah, you, your head sticks up higher yeah, than the higher kids. Than... That's that exact thing I was showing you on the computer. Your head's high. Right, and I'm your going head over is, the radius. Your head is accelerating and decelerating a lot different than the wheels. <laughs> Did you catch that? Paul just answered a question I didn't even know I had about roller coasters. Why do they hurt your neck when you're an adult more than when you're a kid? The answer is not just because you're getting old and frail. It has to do with the distance your head is from the track. Imagine a roller coaster with a loop in the track. This loop is a perfect circle with a radius that is the same distance as your head is from the track. This means that when you enter the loop, the cart starts traveling around it, while your head stays right in the center. Have you noticed the problem? Your head was just traveling at the same speed as the cart, but in the middle of this loop, its forward velocity drops to zero. In physics terms, this is called jerk, a rapid change in acceleration that on paper wants to happen instantaneously. Your head also experiences jerk when the cart exits the loop and pulls your head after it like the tail of a whip, from zero velocity right back up to its initial speed. This model is an exaggeration compared to real life, but the lesson is, the further your head is from the track, the more jerk is experienced as you navigate the geometry of a roller coaster. So if you're, if you're going down a coaster and you go into a loop where your head stayed in the middle of that loop, it would your hit head would zero velocity. Zero and then suddenly, axial velocity. And, and then suddenly, suddenly hit the velocity of the cart again. Up to 25 miles an hour in a very short amount of time. And that is, that is too much acceleration. That would be bad, yeah. 
That is probably the most interesting piece of physics that clicked in my mind on this trip. It's how a sling throws a stone, how a whip breaks the sound barrier. It all comes down to how an object is accelerated through a radius. My sponsor for this video is Brilliant.org, who specialize in explaining physics, math, and logic through practical observations just like this. I especially like Brilliant's hands-on approach because of this connection to the real world. In a classroom, it's easy to forget that a math problem is describing the behavior of real physical objects, like a cart on a roller coaster. And if you learn that math, it can help you actually build one, or any number of other things. Brilliant's courses even have storytelling, code writing, and interactive challenges. This active learning is a great way to ensure you really understand the subjects while having fun learning. They're a great company I've worked with for a long time. Check them out at brilliant.org forward slash Nighthawk. And if you get there fast enough, you can get 20% off a premium membership. I also want to give a big thank you to Paul Gregg for spending the day with me and making this video happen. If you want to build your own roller coasters, there's no better resource than Paul's books. I barely scratched the surface in this video. He has modular designs, spreadsheets to calculate g-forces and energy loss. It's incredible everything he's done to make building a roller coaster feasible in a backyard setting. I'll put a link to Paul's YouTube channel and where you can find his books in the video description below. Thank you for watching this video and sticking around till the end. Thank you those of you who support me on Patreon. You're awesome. I'll see you next time.